what I do with this one. Okay, now I'm looking at the clock because they're changing my talk. So is this okay like this? Yeah, you got the bell. Where's the bell? I have you can use the bell. You don't want the bell? <laughs> okay, so uh, thanks very much. Thanks the thank. I want to thank the organizers for uh, inviting me. Um, so last evening, following yesterday's talks and quite a few exchanges I've had with uh, people, some of whom are present here over the last few months and, and years, uh, rather than going over my talk, I found myself writing this manifesto, uh, which pertains to some of the assumptions, uh, some hidden assumptions that I think underlie. Uh, many of the discussions here, assumptions that I find troubling. So I made a last minute change to my talk. I chopped a third of it out so as to leave myself enough time to read. I won't be able to present because it's uh, raw. It's, it's fresh off the print to read this manifesto. If it goes well, I'll find a box, put it somewhere in Hyde Park and try it there as well. I think everybody should hear it. Um, <coughs> And it, it concerns some trivial observation, I think trivial observations about experience, which are somehow pushed aside and after enough time in the doghouse are just pushed, uh, presented as obviously false, uh, which I think they're not. So, as I said, I got passionate about it after reading it, decided to, uh, after writing it, and decided that uh, I'll, I'll, I'll read it here. Uh, we'll see. I hope it wasn't a mistake. So now to the, to the, to the somewhat uh, uh, shortened uh, version of my talk, um, which has to do with consciousness and time and phenomenology. And I, I have two aims. One is to, uh, challenge, uh, to uh, present some of the challenges concerning temporality, which I think any study of consciousness um, should take into account. And the other is to discuss very briefly how I conceive the, re the relationship between philosophy and phenomenology on, on the one side and, and, and science on the other. Um, so interestingly, interestingly, both passage and consciousness share a common metaphor that, uh, that I'm sure you've all seen, the, the, the light metaphor, even the, the light bulb met metaphor. Um, so the moving spotlight uh, picture of time is having a comeback in, in the works, for example, of, of SCO at MIT. Um, and consciousness is often described as that internal light that distinguishes us from zombies. Um, now, I'm not partic particularly fond of this metaphor in either case, um, but I guess it's driven by the sense that, um, that both passage and consciousness are somehow intangible. They're not matter, they're not energy, they're not, um, they're not a force that is out there. Um, they're not something uh, in the world over and above the things that we actually uh, experience. Um, there is no uh, secret ingredient. <laughs> Um, and what they are exactly is hard to, is ha hard to capture, um, and I guess that's why we resort to a metaphor. Now, uh, focusing on time, here are some questions that I think uh, uh, help unearth the peculiarity of passage. Um, so the first has to do with the uniqueness of the present. What is it that distinguishes present events from events that are not present? Well, what is it that makes uh, something real, so they say, in contrast with other things, if you look at the consecutive uh, positions of an, uh, the arm of a clock, when the arm is here, what does it have that the arm, did, that the, that the arm in its previous positions or, six or, or, uh, or, or future uh, positions doesn't have? It's not a matter of being physically different. Supposedly nothing changed in the physics of the situation. So what is it that those events that are privileged with uh, uh, a presentness are endowed with which events, which other events uh, uh, lack. That's the first question. The other question has to do with duration. So granted that some events are present and others are not, um, no event is point-like or durationless. No event that we, w that we know of out there in the world, no event that makes up one of our experiences is, is, is volumeless, uh, temporally speaking. Um, but, if time flows and flows continuously, then, then on pain of contradiction, we have to conclude that the present is point-like. Uh, Aristotle came to that conclusion, and practically everybody who has dealt with this issue recently, Kripke, come to that same conclusion. So that's a, a, another a challenge. What is the duration of the present, assuming there is such a thing as the present? And finally, what is it that happens when we experience passage, or more accurately, when we experience motion and change? Um, 
Does this experience consist of a succession of experiences that somehow come together to, uh, 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 come together to an experience of change? Or is it one experience of something that uh, changes? As I think James put it, is, is, a, is, is perceiving motion, is it a succession of perceptions or a perception of succession? So uh, these are questions that uh, the metaphysics of time has been dealing with and which highlight that passage is indeed um, hard to pin down. Um, so the moving spotlight uh, uh, doctrine, which as I say has some new supporters, um, addresses these questions. Of course the way it addresses them has to do with how we interpret the metaphor. So the most uh, common way to interpret it is ontologically. So <laughs> the idea is that um, present events, present state, states of affairs are somehow uh, privileged ontologically. Only the present is real or only what is present exists. There are various formulations for this, uh, for this thesis. Um, and that is what time is supposed to be. Time is supposed to be this uh, ontological differentiator that, that distinguishes certain things from others. Those that are ontologically elevated are uh, the present, and this thesis, to the extent that we can make sense of it, uh, answers uh, it's the, the, the three questions I presented before and others as well. So, you know, the, the uniqueness question is answered by the claim that what uh, makes the present unique is that only the present uh, exists. I think there are various problems with this thesis and at any rate it rivals um, a, a different doctrine which is way more uh, popular and, and dominant these days, um, known under various names, we'll use the name eternalism. Um, and according to this uh, doctrine there is no such thing as the present flow is a pa uh, fl uh, the passage of time is an illusion, past the distinction between past, present, and future is an illusion. And um, if there is no real now as an objective feature of, of, of the world, then the question of uniqueness uh, disappears. We can now translate it into a question about our psychology. Um, the question about duration disappears as well because nothing really uh, endures. Um, and the question about experience is answered as it, has, as it was answered by, by, by uh, Parmenides. Benedus, I don't know how to pronounce his name. I know how to pronounce the name only in Greek. <laughs> how do you say it in English? Parmenides, <laughs> we call him here in Jerusalem. His student Zeno and uh, Bertrand Russell. So the idea is what uh, Russell called Cambridge change, that to, ch to, to, to be in change, to be in flux, is simply to occupy si different uh, configurations or different situations, different places in, in space at different times. And that's all there is to it. There is no past, present, future in this, inside in this conception of how we experience there is no flow, different things at different times, that's all there is to change mo and, and, uh, and uh, motion. Now, um, this uh, idea is often augmented by uh, uh, another idea, the specious present. I took these diagrams from the works of uh, Barry Dainton, a British philosopher who was a <laughs> proponent of the specious present. Um, James was a proponent of the specious present many years ago, though I think in a very different way. Um, there's still a, we, we need, to, we want to understand how uh, experiences that are of things that have stages are still uh, experienced as one unified entity. How the experience is unified, maybe how what we experience is unified as well. And with respect to, um, to uh, uh, for example, motion, um, the specious present comes to our, uh, comes to our aid uh, because it's this inner, um, zone where things that are temporally uh, dis uh, distant from each other somehow come together to form a unity. If you think about a melody, for example, consisting of four consecutive notes, A, B, C, and D, we don't experience these as dif distinct events, first year hearing A, then hearing B, then hearing C, and so on. Somehow they come together to form a melody which has a certain unity to it, maybe a, even an indivisible unity, and it's a mystery how that happens. It's supposedly not out there. How does it happen in our psych psychology and, or in our experience? So the specious present, this unreal present, the psychological inner dome is what enables us to have this 
unified experience of things that are uh, distant in time from each other. There are various versions of this idea. On the left there, it's the retentional uh, specious present, the term taken from Husserl, and the idea there is that somehow when, for if, if these are notes, uh, when we hear C, we also hear D, the, f the note that is about to be played as a protension. And then when we hear D, we also hear E as a protension. Um, and, and later, D becomes a retension. And when Husserl uses these terms, his idea is not that D is kept as a memory or something like that. It's the playing of D that is retained. <laughs> D appears first as something we perceive, and then that same D appears under a different mode of intentionality, namely as something that is present as past. So uh, we're not going to present Husserl's uh, complex architecture here, but that's the idea of the retentional model. Dainton has an alternative, the extensional model. He thinks that experience consists of these chunks in which, indeed, C and D, each of them is played only one time, but they are somehow experienced together. Not at the same time, but still together defies my comprehension, I must admit, but at any rate, that's a certain mechanism that you would want to augment eternalism with if you want within eternalism to account for, um, for experience. Okay, so in general, these days, what we have are two options. The president's presentist view, according to which only the present exists, time flows from the past, from, from the future through the present to the past, and it's some kind of this uh, cosmic ontological machinery that, that, that endows certain events in history with a privilege of, of, of existence uh, and then awards it to those that come after. And um, contrasted with this option, uh, the Black universe, according to which everything exists <laughs> equally. There are no ontological distinct distinctions. Of course, not everything exists at the same time. That would be absurd. But it's not that some events are more real than others. Everything is there. And the fact that we supposedly ex experience certain things and not others has to do with our psychology, with the way we perceive it, reality, not with the structure of reality itself. Um, this, of course, is not uh, a, new, um, a new debate. It's many centuries old, so fourth and fifth centuries before uh, BC. Uh, this dispute uh, erupts between Heraclitus and that same Parmenides, um, shown here in, in the School of Athens uh, by Raphael. So the guy sitting down is uh, Parmenides, uh, the champion of the static view, what would now be presented as the black universe according to him. He's the second quotation, what exists is uncreated and imperishable, for it is whole and unchanging and complete. So nothing comes into existence, nothing goes out of existence. It's all there, that block. We, because of our very subjective, very p p uh, contingent and particular constitution, experience it in these temporal slices, but they are not, the, these slices are part of our psychology not part of reality. In contrast with him, Heraclitus holds that everything flows. Pantare, as I'm sure you all know, um, uh, Parmenides' per student, Zeno, has these very, very effective, I must say, arguments to convince us that indeed reality is a continuous sequence of static states, whereas according to Heraclitus, the river flows and we cannot cross it twice. The thing is that nowadays, um, as I said, there's a clear majority of thinkers who have decided with Parmenides and with a static view, and many of them uh, justify their choice uh, by appealing to science. Supposedly, relativity theory has settled the issue. Um, supposedly, according to relativity, the world, cosmolo the, the cosmological world, is indeed a block where within which we cannot find flow, we cannot find any distinctions between past, present, and future. All that has to do with psychology, as Einstein explicitly said. Einstein told uh, or, or expressed this view in various confrontations with philosophers. Your time is merely psychological, physical time is this block time. It doesn't flow. There is no distinction between past, present, and future. This has been articulated quite clearly in a well-known paper by Putnam uh, from 1967, where he says at the end of this paper, it's a very short paper, I conclude that the problem of the reality, I've changed this of passage, is now solved. Moreover, it is solved by physics and not by philosophy. 
Indeed, I do not believe that there are any longer, that there are any longer any philosophical problems about time. There is only the, phys the physical problem of determining the exact physical geometry of the four-dimensional continuum that we inhabit. And I know that uh, Putnam was criticized uh, quite harshly yesterday, so I do not want to partake in any kind of uh, Putnam bashing uh, here to the contrary. I think. Uh, that would be extremely unfair, but on this particular point, I have to disagree with him. Um, and I have, to, uh, men, I have to go back to the date, 1967. It's relevant in two ways. One, one way, it's more than 50 years after special relativ relativity was published. So it did take a few decades uh, for people to articulate in a rig rigorous manner an argument that supposedly leads from relativity to... Uh, to this uh, block universe picture. And on the other side, it's almost, or it's 50 years since this paper was published and Putnam has uh, recounted, you say, has, has, uh, has, take, uh, has taken back his, uh, his, his the statement and, and did not uh, espouse it uh, later. Um, but anyway, I think, I think that uh, it's wrong, the sta Putnam statement is wrong. Um, and the reason is, physics has no possibility of expression for the terms that appear in the, in, in the metaphysical dispute. Physics does not know of a past or a present or a future or of passage or of any of these things. The time of physics is, is calendar time. You can, give, you can give a number. You cannot say what's happening now in the, in the language of physics. So it cannot really uh, have a, 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 a position on, on this matter. Um, uh, and when you look at Putnam's argument, what I've just said is established there very explicitly because the argument actually relies on heavy metaphysical assumptions that need to be introduced between relativity theory and the conclusion. The conclusion does not follow from just from relativity theory. And once you accept these metaphysical assumptions, relativity theory becomes uh, redundant because these assumptions already have this conclusion built into them something that Putnam was unconsciously aware of in that very paper. He says in that very paper, it wouldn't be fair to assume the language of, uh, of eternalism or of the tenses, but that's exactly what he does. And once he does it, the conclusion obviously follows, but you don't really need relativity theory any, anymore. You cannot get this conclusion from relativity theory. So uh, it's not as though this position enjoys some kind of scientific clout that the alternative that the alter alternative uh, lacks. And don't take this from me. You can take it directly from Einstein. This is a letter f by Einstein f uh, from uh, 52, so relatively late in his life and, 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 and 30 years at least after he publicly stated that passage is an illusion and so on. And he says there, um, there is only one possible uh, time, whatever, and where does he say that? Uh, Physics knows, on, physics knows only different values of time, but has no possibility of expression for now. Now, Einstein, when Einstein said these things, what he wanted us to conclude was that there is no now as part of physics, but uh, the conclusion co can go the other way around as well. You know, there is a now, it's objective, it's part of physical reality. Physics can't express it. And, uh, and, okay, I'm going to skip this because we don't have time, but in, in, in private exchanges, Einstein uh, uh, expressed uh, serious worries about, about the position that he, that he, that he voiced uh, publicly. Okay, so uh, now turning to consciousness, I think that answers to these three questions, the uniqueness of the present duration and so on, are, uh, are relevant for analyzing both consciousness of things in time, experience in time, and for time consciousness, whatever it is that we uh, uh, think of time itself. We need to know when we're conscious of something in time, are we conscious of something that is objectively past, present, or future? If, that, if it is, then it's an essential, uh, an essential feature of this thing. So we need to know whether things have this essential feature or not, if we want to th think about how we experience and what we experience. And, um, do events in the world have duration? It's a question. Or are they just uh, point-like sequences of, of states? Um, and when we're conscious of time itself, are we conscious of, of something that flows? This passage, something out there in reality. So I think a clue for, um, a clue for 
uh, approaching these questions. Uh, first of all, these questions are phenomenological questions, the questions that we need to deal with before we set out to do science. They're descriptive. It's the, the, the challenge is descriptive. We need to describe experience and describe the temporal aspects uh, of experience. And when we uh, attend to this task, there's a, there's, a, there's a feature about passage that is peculiar to it, which we should pay attention to. Um, passage is unique, or temporality is unique, different from, for example, colors and shapes and maybe meanings and so on, in that it is shared by the experience and the Exp and whoever experiences. It's shared by the event that we experience and by the experience of the event. So when we experience red, the experience itself is not red. When you experience a square, the experience itself is not square. When you experience that something is over there, the experience itself is not over there. But when we experience that something is happening now, that experience too is happening now. And it's the same now. The experience and the experience are part or partake in the same present. Um, moreover, that's how we experience, or that's how time comes into experience. Temporality is not given by apprehending, apprehending something as temporal, uh, um, but by the apprehension itself being temporal, and in fact having the same temporal properties of whatever it is that we're experiencing. Um, so. Passage is not a, another phenomenon that we can attend to. Passage is part of what we attend to. There are various uh, literary uh, works in which the protagonist tries to attend to time passing and fails doing that. There's a work by Agnon, the, Israel, the, the Hebrew writer. There's a work by Canon, the French uh, mathematician and, and philosopher and, and writer, in which it so happens in both these works. I always I try to I try to see if there was any inspiration. If w in one way they inspired each other, but you have these shopkeepers sitting at the entrance to their shop trying to f experience the passage of time and failing to do so because all they can experience are the things before them, but passage is as an essential aspect of, of, of that which they're uh, experiencing. So, um, passage and presentness, oops, sorry, I skipped a slide. Uh, Past and present are not something we experience. In addition to experiencing something, an event, an object, a state of affairs, they are what makes the experience and the experience temporal. They constitute the temporal framework that is shared by the experience and the experience. Um, and as I said, I think that is something that we need to th be aware of when we try to uh, f give answers to those questions that, uh, that accompany us throughout uh, these comments. Um, now. I think this is almost the last slide. Um, so I want to say, let, let to consider before the manifesto, that's the most important thing. Um, something about passage in the brain. So if there's nothing more to attend to uh, when we're attending to something, uh, which is passage as something separate or over and above and so on, um, does it make sense to look for uh, neural correlates for passage? Uh, a, a, a project that I know some of the people in this conference are engaged with. Um, there is neural activity obviously associated with seeing someone walking their dog. Is there in addition another activity, a, a, a correlate for perceiving transients, for perceiving the passage that is part of the scene which one is experiencing, or for creating the illusion of passage if indeed passage is an illusion? And I think there's some difficulty in the assumption that there is, because say there is, supposedly this activity um, is itself a succession of states, and a succession of states does not represent passage. It's a succession of states. It's that Cambridge change of Russell's. Um, so if this neural activity is supposed to represent passage, it, it, it probably does it. The only other way it can do it is by undergoing the same passage that it is supposed to represent. So it, goes, it undergoes the very thing that it stands for. But if that's the way it represents passage, then the experience of the man walking the dog is enough. We don't need another, another brain module or, another, or other brain activity that somehow processes the passage. Um, if this is 
truer than, than looking for a, an NCP, a neural correlate for passage, is, is looking for something in vain. There's nothing there to find, just as there isn't an additional thing, passage, uh, on top of what happens, uh, there, there wouldn't be additional brain activity that somehow processes it. Um, I, I myself think it's probably, it's doubtful, okay, whether, how, many, how much time does that leave me for the manifesto? Let me just skip this, this is way more important. <laughs> um, yeah, so I just, I, I, I end the, <coughs> the, the cut up uh, talk by raising questions about uh, the quest for a neural correlate for passage, and I wanted to talk about parallel, parallels concerning consciousness, because I think there are these parallels between passage and, and, and consciousness. If there is no point looking for an NCP, maybe there's no point for looking for an NCC as well. But we can talk about that later. Now, now for this, if I can see it, I'll read it. So let me go out on a limb here and say something that may shock at least some of you. Reality exists. It is not inside our heads, it's not some internal theater, it's not a reconstruction, it's not a construction, it's not a belief. And we actually do experience it directly as it is. Uh, clouds float in the sky. the sky, the grass is green, people usually dress before leaving their homes and they are not just collections of elementary particles. Chairs are small enough to fit into rooms and it's been an hour since we started this session, a bit more. And by reality I mean hard, physical, objective reality. Nothing different from what all you scientists think, uh, mean when you talk about reality. Walls are solid, coffee is liquid, even if on the microscopic lev level both are mostly vacuum. Tomatoes are red, even if the molecules making them up are not, and time passes even if Einstein said it doesn't. We see things as they are, our experience is usually trustworthy. Contrary to a view often voiced, science and certainly philosophy have not contradicted any of this. It's not as if modern science has led us to understand that things are not how we think they are or how we experience them to be. People put a lot of weight on how the senses deceive us, colorblindness, drugs, glasses, neuro neurological defects, mad scientists, some in, some in presence here, messing with our brains. All these have immediate and substantial experiential impact. And there are dreams, illu illusions, hallucinations, technologically induced sensations, and so on. And some elements of, uh, and aspects of experience are indeed subjective. But these facts are often taken as constituting conclusive evidence that at best our, ev our experience is always mediated, that we do not experience reality directly, perhaps not at all. But this inference is uh, ungrounded. Descartes introduced the deceptive demon as a thought experiment, and now it's become reality. We supposedly live inside our own private cinema or asylum. Maybe even we're brains in a vat. If all we ever access is our inner theater, why insist there's anything outside? But again, there's no logical, scientific, epistemic, conceptual reason for holding on to this nightmarish picture of reality. It's time we got over this collective neurosis. Now you see the Hyde Park part of it. Reality is precisely what we experience it to be when all is normal. Of course, there are abnormal circumstances, but there's no logical road leading from the abnormal cases to the conclusion that also the normal cases are abnormal. From illusions to the conclusion that we never experience veridically. There's no evidence or unavoidable reason to believe that our senses always mislead us, that, we, uh, that what we see are mental re images, representations, pictures, that our brains create reality. Of course, there's a biological mechanism facilitating experience, but it does not stand between us and the world and does not prevent direct, unmediated access to the things that make up our environment. These things themselves are not beyond our grasp or our sensory reach. Moreover, it is only because the world is given to us as it is that we can study this mechanism. Philosophy and science presuppose direct realism, that the world is the way it is perceived by us when all is normal. The more we understand the mechanism, the more we, we can manipulate it and create distortions or fix it to remove unwanted distortions. But distortions is a normative term writing on the notion of veridic veridicality. That by tampering with the brain we can make a tomato look blue does not mean that it is the brain that produces the colors we see. Tomatoes are red and look red. That is presupposed by the science that is used when one is made to see the tomato blue. In this sense, science builds on and comes after phenomenology, a rudimentary phenomenology at least, some basic description of the phenomenon in its studies, or features pertinent to the phenomenon, such as its temporal aspects. Or let's put it differently. Without experience being what it is and being reliable, there wouldn't be empirical science. We can't, on the basis of science, reach conclusions which, were they true, would undercut the possibility of doing that very science. 
Denying that experience gives us the world as it is, is tantamount to adopting such a self-defeating conclusion. Yes, sometimes science brings about revisions of deeply entrenched beliefs. We no longer think that the Earth is, fl is flat or that it is the center of the universe. We can't always take our experience at face value. And yes, sometimes we encounter unexpected phenomena which defies not only our common sense but also our best scientific comprehension. Quantum non-locality, something I've been troubled by for the last few years, may, may be an example. But some fundamental features of phenomenology are beyond science and, presu and presupposed by it, and these features are immune to revisions in light of science. Temporal passage is a case in point. Science and phenomenology should coexist side by side, but in separate spaces with mutual respect for each other's privacy. Everyone can do anything, no prohibition on scientists doing phen phenomenology, that we live inside a private subjective theater, that our brains create reality, that the macro is reducible to the micro, that the mental just is the physical, that temporal passage is an illusion, all these are legitimate views. What is not legitimate is to present these views as science or as scientifically supported. A metaphysics grafted on science is not science, remarked Bergson to Einstein, that was in uh, April uh, 6, 1922, they clashed in Paris. When the latter, when Einstein presented his claims about time as logical consequences of relativity theory, and what was true then is just as true now. And let us be cautious of weak analogies. I'm referring to some talks yesterday. Anscombe, Elizabeth Anscombe, the great British philosopher, points out that inferring from the predictability of the motions of the planets that there's no free will is a bit, ra it's a bit rash, hasty. In our context, there are too many significant differences between temperature and sadness for the reducibility of thermodynamics to statistical mechanics to tell us anything about the relationship between the physical and the mental. For example, normativity is essential to making emotions and many of our beliefs and to what they are, but it is irrelevant to temperature. So no, I wouldn't rush to invest in a reductive prob uh, program uh, just now, one identifying the mental with the physical. And by the way, physical is another term that is being thrown around a lot, which uh, deserves some consideration. Uh, the physical-mental dichotomy is highly suspect, uh, which of course is, does not mean that everything is, is physical, just that the conceptual distinction between the physical and the mental deserves some attention. Nor do I think that we're faced with a forced choice that was presented yesterday, reductionism, dualism, or something incoherent or inconsistent. What used to be called common sense realism is neither of these, and it's high time for it to make a comeback. Putnam was a, a, a common sense or a naive realist. Sometimes you hear it being lamented that aspects of experience or of what we experience are beyond what, we, what can be investigated by physics in particular by science in general. The lamentation is not by physics or of physics, but by physicists or, physi or by physicists or more frequently philosophers of physics that are chained to an idea, a doctrine, physicalism, a kind of messianism, which again is a possible metaphysical stance, but certainly not a necessary offshoot of science or of physics. And I think often physicalism is presented as part of physics. It's not, it's metaphysics. The bottom line, peaceful coexistence with the recognition that physics and philosophy have different agendas. Passage is a matter for, for phenomenological study and only for that. That does not render it subjective or psychological. It's subjective and real as anything else is. It just so happens that some features of objective reality reside in that background that sustains, among other things, science. Perhaps there's a lesson uh, here for uh, consciousness studies as well. Thank you. Thank you. Very bold indeed. Um, so you made many different claims. I, wanna, I want to focus on one of them um, in your manifesto, which it seems to me as if you adopt a somewhat dichotomous way of looking at things. So it's either everything is real and we have direct unmediated access to the physical world or everything is made up by our brain and we don't. And I don't think that uh, either views, so I, I don't think that was the view that was made yesterday or, or that this is the view made by scientists. But I do think that there is, so y uh, there is some subtlety. So there are cases, as you said, where we perceive things not as they really are. 
uh, and other things where we, d where we don't. But to say that the tomato is red, we know, for example, that other species, so for a bee, tomato is not red. So what is the meaning of, this, of the claim tomato is red and we see it as red? It is red for us because it's a, it's a, it's a, point, it's a connection <laughs> between the physical reality and our nervous system. But so this is what I'm trying to kind of get at. What do you mean by saying that we have unmediated access? Mediated by what? It's not mediated by any external thing, but it is mediated by our own nervous system and the way it is organized. And to say that, th that the tomato is red is something that I just do not understand, like the meaning of the claim. Well, do you understand the meaning of the claim that this, uh, this panel is rectangular? I, I understand is it. Is it an objective feature of this stand yeah, that so it has so rectangular the, the stands? The tomato has an objective feature, which is the wavelength that is being omitted by it, and it is perceived as red by me, and it is perceived, I'm not sure because I'm not an expert in bee vision, yeah. oh, sorry, but it's perceived as some other color by the bee. It yeah. has an objective, I, I, don't, I, d I don't think any of us or most of us would deny an objective that, that things in the real world have objective features. Mm -hmm. But these objective features then meet our nervous system and create some kind yeah. of experience that is our experience. So, y so you're, you're pulling in with your question to what, uh, what Locke called secondary qualities. I insist on, on primary qualities because over in the end, I'd like to reject this uh, distinction. The same argument you just made could be, could be made about shapes. And then you'd ask yourself, is, is, is the shape of this thing an outcome of some kind of interaction between something out there, which we don't really know because we don't want to describe it as, ob as, as objectively or independently of us rectangular, and the way uh, our brain processes whatever information comes from there. So uh, it's much easier for me to speak about shapes because don't, people don't have the very strong intuition they do have with respect to color that there's something subjective about color. I don't think colors are, are subjective. It's a, it's, a, it's a big issue. I can't. Uh, but in general, my answer is no. I don't think that we can reduce anything uh, uh, a priori to, um, to uh, uh, its, its, its physical properties or the properties that it has in the context of a, of, of a physical theory, such as wavelengths and so on. Um, I think we have these, we have these theories um, on the basis of reliable experiences that we have of the world, and we wouldn't have them if we didn't have them. We don't speak this way. Okay, <laughs> I should have said, the manifesto is a statement of many uh, op uh, opinions that I hold on to very, f very strongly. I did not give arguments because arguments t take too long. That's the fun part. We need more time for that. I do think I have an argument for why the sky is, you know, on a sunny day blue or the bell is red and so on. And in these arguments, I think I would be able to show, probably to not convince anybody, but to show that you cannot reduce color experience to, you know, the story of physics about wavelengths and interaction with uh, receptors and so on. You need to have a real experience of colors in order to even get that theory going. And the fact that bees have a different experience, that you can manipulate how I experience color by messing around with my brain and so on, all that rides on the fact that we actually do know the world. When everything is okay, we do know the world, then we can build theories, and with these theories create various... You said that, you know, many, often these experiments are very, are, are done in, you know, very uh, isolated lab... lab we need the, uh, the, 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 the everyday experience in order to create these, uh, these uh, highly controlled experiments in the laboratory, and I think the everyday experience is of, you know, things having color. We never speak about the color of things as something psychological. We think we speak of them as properties of the things in, out there, just as shapes, mass, and so on, location, motion, because they are. And there's no reason not to go on thinking what we actually grow up thinking. Yeah. Uh, so I have uh, two, uh, two things, uh, two comments. One is uh, related to what Liad said, and uh, I would put it differently. I would say that we are part of the world. We, our brains. So there is uh, the physical uh, aspects of the, uh, that are independent of us, uh, such as the uh, wavelength, for example, and uh, so completely independent of us, and they are this, uh, and that are part of the world. Our receptors in the eye are part of the world. Our brains, the way that they are built, are part of the world. And the interaction between these things create reality in within the sphere of this interaction in this very same way that the that the, the properties of a molecule are the 
result of interaction between uh, between atoms, and uh, the interaction is di uh, and the result of the interaction is different from different, not necessarily more or not necessarily less than the sum of its parts. So this is the first qu uh, this is the first uh, uh, comment that I would like you to respond to. The other one is uh, this picture that you are showing here co uh, from Koch, I believe, with the dog uh, with the, the the man seeing the dog. Uh, so. And you are saying we, there's no way we can perceive, uh, we don't need anything else except the immediacy of experience here. For now, passage. Uh, yes, the passage. Uh, however, there is something called working memory, which is very important. And this man who is looking at the dog and his normal, and he's looking <laughs> at it without, be, uh, without this picture being masked, when you are looking at its brain, you will see a certain reverberation a certain type of persistence of a certain uh, of, of certain activity, a certain type of process going on in that brain that takes time, and you can measure this time. Whereas, if you will show the same picture to a person under masking conditions, you it it will be perceived at a very different level, but you will not see this reverberation. For example, now this reverberation, the working memory, has something to do with the passage of time, and there is very interesting work that I, I didn't hear anybody here talk about it. By a, by, a ver, by, a guy, by a very great scientist, in my opinion, called Richard Semon, who worked on memory. He didn't invent the term, or, uh, the term uh, uh, Richard Semon in the beginning of the 20th century. He didn't talk about, uh, about, the th about uh, working memory. He didn't define the term. It was defined later. But he talked about mechanisms of such, of such kind and about the persistence that we, that some animals, including humans, of course, but not all animals, possibly, have when they experience time. And uh, I think that uh, this working memory idea, I would like you to, uh, uh, to talk about it within the context of your theory. Okay, I'll, I'll answer very briefly because I'm sure we're running out of time. Your first comment, it's, uh, I, I think it's almost ironical that often uh, in the context of, 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 of uh, scientists reflecting philosophically on their work, um, their uh, metaphysical sensibility gravitates either towards Cartesianism, it's all uh, an internal theater, or towards almost Berkeleyan idealism. The world is a product also, maybe not only, but also, well, I'm just repeating things you said. You said that we're part of the world, our brain is part of the world, our sensory organs are part of the world, and the our conception of the world is the outcome of interactions <coughs> between inputs from the world and this... We are the world. The, this distinction is meaningless. We are the world? Yes. That's a nice song. I know it... <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I don't, know, I don't understand what it means. I mean, we're part of, nobody disputes that we're part of the world. The question is, is there a world that is apart from us? Of course we're part of the world, but we're not all, we are not the world. That's, I don't understand what that could mean. The question is, is the world as we experience it created a, a product of an interaction between something out there that we cannot even describe because it's beyond our grasp and our organic uh, 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 apparatus? That's the question. And I would, my claim was, no. No, there is a world and we actually know it. And by knowing this world, we can study the apparatus that enables that. But the apparatus is not between us and the world. With respect to working memory and so on, that has to do with the apparatus. Do you have a definition for passage? Do you, do you, do you I mean, are, are we supposed to understand what the passage of time is from looking at our brains? Or do we need to know something about the world, inc including its temporality, before we study our brains? I think that's the question. And often, what you hear is, let's look at the brain, and by looking at the brain, get answers to various ancient, but also contemporary metaphysical questions, such as, what is time? So, Einstein gave that uh, question and answer on the basis of relativity theory. Now it's more brain science. And I have a question about this methodology. Are you going to learn some? I mean, this is a serious question. What is it that distinguishes the present from other times? Do events have duration? Now, you, we're going to look at brain processes in order to answer these questions? Maybe. I'm, not, I'm just raising this as a question. I, I know many, most people here probably say yes. But... Uh, 
I still want to understand what it is the phenomena that this brain is supposed to be able to process that we're trying to understand. Fantastic. Okay. <laughs> I'm told that they've removed the THC from the coffee and um, <laughs> replaced it with psilocybin for the next section. Uh, anyway, we have a coffee break, uh, and, uh, and, that, and we should be back here at 11. Let's thank the, sp the first two speakers again.